Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Garrett. And I am one of the 14 alcoholic trustees. And so, how do you get to be a trustee? Or at least, how did I get to be one? First place, I had to be a drunk. The second place, my life had to be unmanageable. And when I'm talking about unmanageable, I'm not talking about managing other people's lives. I was the type of a person that didn't know where he was going, and when he got there, he didn't know where he was. And I had a problem of getting from here to there. I can remember it was a Sunday afternoon, and the weather was about like this, and my wife ran out of bread. You know, we had some visitors there, and she said, well, Garrett, would you... Go down to the store and get some rolls. And Garrett proceeded to go to the store to get some rolls. But he stopped on the way. And uh, I finally tried to get back home. And what happened? I passed the house four times. And my wife was so embarrassed that she finally got my daughter to sneak me in the back. And put me in the basement where people whose lives unmanageable are supposed to be. <laughs> and so, so here today, I'm standing up before you with all this wisdom and all of everything, all of this sobriety, and they tell me that I'm supposed to be trusted, and a leader. And it's a long ways, baby, from not being able to get back home from buying a loaf of bread. (laughs) So, that's the way you begin to get here. And then you come into the program, you go to a meeting, and at the time I came in, they had these old thick porcelain cups. And uh they always detail the junior ambitious drunk to uh, washing these cups. And so I was assigned the detail of washing the cups. And unfortunately one night, I'm trying to do this job right, I left some soap on the cup, and the next meeting, everybody had dysentery. <laughs> so, so they rotated me out of that job. <laughs> they told me I, I wouldn't have to uh, do that anymore. So they started me to making coffee. So nobody would drink the coffee. I was saving the group money. So the people wouldn't drink the coffee. So they rotated me to be the chairman. And so I was the chairman for a while. And finally came an opportunity that we were invited to join the Washington area in a group. And they said, hell, we'll get rid of them now for good. (laughs) And you know how they do in these groups. They have a tendency to send us, uh, send these people or some of us in service to least unqualified to do the job. So I made it down to the inner group and to their greatest surprise, them I didn't end up the inner group chairman and nobody in the group could understand what happened. So just from bumbling from one job to another and that's how you get a chance to rotate. <laughs> I managed to get up to be a delegate, 
And then the final chapter of this story is that they pulled my name out of a hat. And so I am now your a regional trustee from the Northeast region. It is a privilege for me to be here. Everybody looks beautiful here. I enjoy the hospitality here. I want to thank you for inviting me here. And everybody has done everything that I wanted. But the confusing thing was this. When I received a letter from Carlos, I didn't know whether Carlos was a man or a woman. You know, it was one of these names that I wasn't used to. And I said, how in the world? I was, I wanted a writer, a writer, whatever it was, but I couldn't, <laughs> I didn't know, and I was sort of embarrassed. I didn't know what to say. So eventually we made a telephone contact, and Carlos has been very uh, cooperative, and she's done quite a bit for me, and so the rest of the committee, Bob, and Tom, and Everybody. So I enjoy being here. It's customary to start these things off with a joke. So I will tell you about a drunk. And the reason why I want to tell you about this drunk is because uh, uh, I'm here. Because I had reached, I reached a point in my drinking because, uh, my self-will and my self-knowledge, I continued to drink. But I can remember on this on uh, this occasion, on these occasions, that I was living in an apartment house there in Washington. And I wasn't a drunk then, but I, can, uh, I remember coming home one night, and here was this drunk at his door. I guess he was at his door, and he was fumbling with the key trying to get in, and he couldn't unlock the door. And a sweet little voice hollered from the other side of the door. And she said, is that you, honey? And he sort of paused a minute. And he made this reply that drunks would make. So who in the hell else got a key beside me? So, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, so the next time, I saw the gentleman, he was all in crutches and cast and everything in the barber shop. And so I was asking what had happened to him. And so uh he came home one night, half south, and he was laying up in the bed there with his wife. And his wife started talking in her sleep. And she said, my God, that's my husband. And he jumped out the window and broke both his legs. And so, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so Garrett said, "I never wanted to be like that." I mean, in other ways, it was knowledge there, and I never wanted to be a person like him. I, I, I just didn't want to go through that experience. But let's go back to me now. Everybody want to know something about me. I deal with alcohol. It is cunning, baffling, insidious, and powerful. And that didn't begin with the first drink that I took. I was born and reared uh, not, well, about 240 miles from me, I think in a place in southern Georgia called Valdosta. Anybody ever heard of it? I graduated from uh, the Dasher High School there in 1936. I was a 1936 graduate of the Dasher High School in Valdosta. I had just reached my 16th birthday, and I had uh, a couple of scholarships, and one of them was to come to Washington, D.C., to Howard University. And that's how I happened to get in Washington. But what I can think about, and when I come back to Georgia, when I left Georgia, I was a person, I thought, with a lot of ambition, 
a clean record. And I thought I had all the qualities to make a person out of me. I had great expectations of myself. But I can think back to a little bit farther than that after my father died. My aunt came to visit us and she bought this stepson of hers, George. George was a good guy. And you, uh, I, I like George because George, he was, he was knowledgeable. He could teach you different things and he, he was a great guy and he used to follow George around and everything. I guess I was about seven years old and everything but at that time. But George was a drunk. And George got drunk and he would, he kept getting drunk. So he eventually he wound up, I guess, on the chain gang and kind of road or whatever it was. And so my aunt took my brother and me out there to see George, and he was in these shackles and everything. So my brother and I made this commitment that we would never be like George. Now, my brother never drank, but I did. But what I'm trying to say is that the two of us went through the same experience one of us ended up a drunk, and the other one didn't. So at the beginning, that's why I say this alcohol that I deal with is cunning, baffling, and insidious, even before I took the first drink. And then you come, you come down the line, you know, when I got to Washington there, you know what they used to have, these uh, radio shows, the court well, it used to be drunk court, and you used to listen to these drunks get up, and you would laugh. It was supposed to be a sort of a comical thing, and the judge would say 30 and 60 days and all like that. And I said, no, I would never be that way. If I ever got to the point, if I ever took a drink, and I couldn't handle it, that I would stop. Then, to uh, as I told you, I came up to uh, Howard University at that particular time on this scholarship, and they had us all in this assembly uh, room, all uh, what they call the honors program. And then I'll never forget this Dr. Fraser getting up and telling us, he said, I will either make you Distinct, we'll either make you distinguished men and women, or you will end up a drunk in the Washington Post Office. <laughs> and I said, that will never happen to you, Garrett. That was in 1936. In 1956, do you know who's a drunk in the Washington Post Office? <laughs> that was Garrett. And, and things happened. And how did I get there? I had a hard time getting to be a drunk. You know, uh, I hear some of these people that get up and they tell you, say, well, I took this first drink and I got this glow and I, I danced and I did all this stuff. And, uh, and I don't know, I just felt like a different person. The first drink I took went down the wrong damn pipe and I damn near choked to death. And so, from that, you would think that that would have been a signal. You know, usually people just don't fool around with things that would choke them to death. You know, you would stay away from that kind of stuff. So, I abstained from drinking for a while. And then it came a time that I was supposed to take this uh, young lady to a uh, junior-senior prom. And it was, this was a bipolar experience. And I had hustled up enough money to get a tux and everything. So I don't know some guys that we stopped off at this place before we went to the dance and they, somebody bought some orange gin. And that was my second introduction to alcohol. So I drank some of this orange gin and I mixed it up, you know, with a malted milk. And so, what happened? 
I went back into the little boy's room, vomited all over the tucks and everything, and I couldn't go to this occasion. And so I lost that girl. Maybe it was a good thing and maybe it was a bad one. But the next morning when Garrett woke up, he said he would never drink another malted milk as long as it was. <laughs> but that 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 night was one of these aversion sort of experiences too. But for a long time, every time I, it wasn't only the malt and milk, but every time I just thought of alcohol, I would think about what happened, and I would think about this vomiting, you know. But this was my first experience in vomiting, and I vomited a many times. After then, vomiting got so it was a sort of a good experience to you. <laughs> so finally, it came to a point that a guy told me, well, he, he told me how I could drink. And I took that drink, and it did stay on my stomach. But the thing what happened to me and what I'm talking about, this disease of alcoholism is sort of a cunning baffling and insidious, that what alcohol did for me was that I had a tolerance for alcohol, and I could drink a whole lot of it. But little did I know that that was a sign that eventually that my life was going to become unmanageable because of alcohol. And it's all kind of little experiences that come in there is drinking that I thought was funny at the time, but maybe there was there were signs that I should have changed. I don't know. One night, because my wife not here, I can tell it, and so you you can blank this out on the tape because uh, I wouldn't want this to be played. But anyway, they uh. You know, you used to go to play, call them tourist homes back when I was growing up, you know. So I ended up in a tourist home. Well, I ended up somewhere. At least I woke up and I didn't know where I was. And there was a note on the bed, and it said, Garrett, I had a good time last night. I'll see you tonight at the same time. At the same place, Edna. <laughs> that was 40 years ago. And I don't know where the same time or the same place or what it was. I don't even know what Edna looked like. But, <laughs> but you would think, going through such experiences like this, it would be a sort of a... a, a, a a warning to you about what was going to happen. If anybody's familiar with Washington, well, back in the old days, I know uh, one man in here knows about this. Old number one highway coming from Baltimore to Washington, and they had this dead man's curry. And I was coming back <clears throat> one night with this guy, and uh, I was he let me drive. And so finally he said to me, he said, Garrett, he said, do you think you're going to make that curve up there? I said, hell, man, I thought you were driving. But I'm talking about, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but you would have thought. All of these things would have meant something to you. It will meant to leave that stuff alone. You know, I mean, if you can't, you couldn't manage it, but I couldn't manage it then, and I couldn't manage it later on, and I can't manage it now. Then I go into the military, and uh, I think I got to be, uh, I crossed the borderline drinking that 3.2 fall staff and going to the latrine. Because uh, 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 that Paul staff, it did. I don't know what you. Know, I see them advertised now. They advertise, you know, to, to take the proof out of the alcohol and it might nothing. Don't believe that, because that three point two Paul staff would do something to you too. It wouldn't make you high, 
but it would make you a drunk. I went overseas. And I was in uh in the China Burma India theater. I was up in the jungles of Burma. No women, no booze, nothing, really. And I can remember going down, we about after two years, we went down to Calcutta, and the first woman I saw, I shook, my teeth rattled, and my knees buckled. And I said, Lord, look what had happened to me before I was 25. I said, this, this is, this was it. But, but here was the strange thing about it. When I got back up in the jungles there, I didn't think about sex. I thought about booze. Now, you, what I'm trying to say, there were guys over there drinking that jungle juice and everything, and we were talking about that they were, they had a drinking problem. But this is an insidious disease, and pay attention to what I'm talking about. It's because here I was, thinking that I was different from these people. But to think about the drink is just as bad as drinking it when you're in a place like that. Because when I came back to the States, and when I took a drink, that was when my life definitely became unmanageable. So I went back to the Washington Post Office. So if the only thing you needed was a strong back and strong kidneys. And you could make it, you know. And so uh, you didn't have to know how to read it. I don't know, somehow you wouldn't have to know how to read the mail. You could, you could get it. You could get it put up there, and you could get it on the street. That was one of the peculiar things about it. Uh, and you could deliver it. So I stayed there in the Washington Post office, and it used to bother me because I could always go back to remember what Dr. Frazier said, that you were going to end up a drunk in the Washington Post office. And that would sort of depress me at times. But on the other hand, I was one of these virtuous drunks. And a virtuous drunk is one of these guys you get so, well, whoever it is, the eyes of the gal, you get so drunk you can't do nothing. And I always wanted to, I always wanted to commit a dog or do something like that, but I never could make, I could, <laughs> if you put the bottle there first, and the woman second, nothing would never happen, Gary. And the bottle was always first. And so I used to think about this. I said, well, it's good that I am a drunk. At least I'm not out there sinning like the other people. <laughs> <laughs> and I could rationalize on, on that, too. And, and to bolster this attitude that uh, was old bootlegger. Uh, on Sunday morning. That was the only extra job I ever had. Uh, I would go around to his house and bootleg while he went to church. He was a deacon at the top <laughs> And so, it, it was sort of a safe thing to do. So, I was there and he'd give me about three or four half pints and that would take me home for maybe a day or so. And then he would give me uh, his spirituality when he got back. And I w it would always be a sort of a conflict because I was wondering, I said, how in the world can you go to church on Sunday as a bootlegger? I said, doesn't it bother you? He said, man, it's illegal. It ain't not, there ain't nothing wrong with selling whiskey. He said, you the one getting drunk. I ain't getting drunk. <laughs> so when I got sober... So when I got sober, when it came time for me to take the fifth step, you know, some people, they pick out the priest and all these type of people. But I went to a man that I knew had a good spiritual foundation, and that was my bootlegger. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat down there, and I laid it out on the line. 
and I made my terms, and I got the relief that you got, I don't of whether you went to a holy place or not. But that was the way it was. Now, how did I get the AA? How did I get the AA? One night, it was in the wintertime. I came home, and I don't know how I got there, but my wife said she opened the door, and I fell in the door. My head was bleeding. You know what happened to drunks, you know. And she was frightened, and she called his friend, and he took me to the doctor. And he came over to my house the next day, and he said, uh, Garrett, I didn't know you drank like you do. And so I was, you know, how you are, you're all remorseful and depressed and everything. And I talked to him. And he said, well, I know some people down at the 12th Street Y. They meet every Sunday. And the ex-drunks are getting the drunks sober. But, you know, my head wasn't too clear from what had happened the night before. And so that didn't make too much sense to me. But that was the first message that I got from a non-alcoholic, that there was a place to go. And I told Marguerite, I said, sweetheart, I will never drink like that no more. And which I didn't. The next thing I did, and I, I stayed off the booze until about, about May. And I bought some pig feet. I didn't have a problem with drinking. I had a problem with sobriety, just sober. Everything, I I was always sober when I took the first drink. So in other words, I'm here because I had a sober problem. It wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a drinking problem. So Gary get the pig feet, and he put them on the stove there, and he turned the fire down real low and let them simmer. And I cut the grass and I perform all the chores that you're supposed to perform. And what happens to Garrett is what happens to a lot of us drunks. That unpredictable urge comes. That urge comes to take a drink and they talk about this drink. They talk about it in the big book. We can't explain what happened to us. And the next thing I know, I looked at my watch. I said, I can make it down there in 15 minutes and have a pint. And you know, you can always tell a drunk he buys half pint. Half pint is about the most convenient thing it ever was for a drunk. I go down and I get this half pint, I thought. And then I lost all sense of time. And then on my way back home, I heard the fire trucks, you know. And when I get to the corner, I said, it looks like the fire trucks at my house. And that's where they were. Them pig feet left that old, I think that old is still in the house, you know. <laughs> and every time it rains and my wife get a whiff of them pigs, she can, boy, she can, uh, she can let the thing go. But uh, all those type of experiences. I, I, I never intended to get drunk. But I did. And I told her then. I said, well, sweetheart, I never cook no more pig feet like you know, huh? I'm out of the pig feet cooking business. And so what happened? Before the summer was over, I went to sleep on the sofa and burnt the sofa up. You know? And I had become, what I'm talking about, my life had really become unmanageable. And there was nothing that I could do about it. And then I came a time, I got sober then, and I stayed sober for about a year, over a year. And I was feeling good, I was looking good, and everything looked like it was coming my way. And what happened to Garrett? I was offered a job, and it was a job I sincerely wanted. And the man called me and told me, he said, well, you come in Friday, so you have been selected for this uh, job. And so you just come in and you go through the routine, and that would be it. So what do I do? I 
Go downtown. Because Eddie knows what I'm talking about. And I went to Louis and Thomas' house. I bought a couple of suits, a couple of shirts, a couple of pair of shoes. And on my way home, I was sort of happy and everything about what was going to happen the next day. But I can't explain to you what actually happened because I never got home with the suits. I ended up drunk in a place that I'd never been before. I don't, I don't know why I went there and I don't know what occasion took me there, but I got home with no suits. And then I made a decision then that I was a hopeless drunk and nothing could be done about it and that I would probably die a drunk. I didn't take that job and I continued to drink until it's a funny thing. The message that I received from a non-alcoholic cropped up in my mind that there were some people down at the 12th Street Y and the drunks were getting sober from the help of the ex-drunk. So I go down to the uh, Y that night to see what was happening. And I said, well, if they're going to help a drunk, I better get a little half pint and let them know uh, what was happening. So I went into my first meeting there at the Y. And who do I meet? I met a guy there I thought I had been to his wake about two years before. The, you know, and I kept looking at him. And he kept looking at me. I said, this couldn't be, you know. And sure enough, after the meeting, he came over. And he shook my hand and everything, and I damn near, you know, passed out because I thought he was dead, really. And so, but anyway, I made it. I made it that night. And they told me to keep coming back, and I can remember the first night. And they told me it was the first drink that made me drunk. Now, here comes this thing of sponsorship. Most people, you know, uh, I hear them get up to these podiums and they talk about the wisdom of sponsors and how they could call them up and they could they could solve all the problems, you know. And uh, well, Garrett wasn't that lucky. I mean, I wish I would have been. You know, maybe I'd have been a better uh, sober person than I am now. I, I didn't get one of them guys that had all this wisdom and could answer all these questions that you asked me. There's a guy he adopted me for his pigeon. And I look at him and he would look at me and he'd come to my house on Sunday and I'd sit down and I'd look at him and he would look at me. And what I'm talking about now is that you can get sober through the nonverbal message. I mean people don't have people don't have to be talking for you to get the message. Just to sit there and look at him did something for me. And I would be sweating and all nervous after he left. And my wife said, what in the world did that man do to you? I said, he didn't do nothing to me. She said, well, and I wasn't drinking. That's all it would take with that little Sunday dose of uh, his presence. <laughs> and the serenity prayer, and I was staying away. I'd have to say the serenity prayer after he left, you know. And it was just that. So she said, what in the world is happening to you, Garrett? She said, well, what, what are this programs all about? Well, that guy, he looked like the next drink that he took would be his last one. And he would be sitting there on that sofa, and I thought he was going to fall dead on the sofa, you know. And he wouldn't say nothing, but he would just look. And I said, I said, was, is this what was happening to me? And so, you know, I could go to work the next morning. And whenever this age would come up to drink, I would think about him. <laughs> and I would stay away from the first drink. He really played a role in my sobriety, you know, before I could. Because, you know, when we first come in there, we can't even read too much. No way. We can't understand what we read in the first place. Well, on the other hand, that was another fellow 
He played a role in my sobriety. Too. See what I'm talking about? The alcoholic and the non-alcoholic can get you sober if you listen to the message that they give you. Now, here was this fellow. I used to drink with him, but I never saw him get drunk, you know. So we were riding home, and his name was Bullock. And I saw Bullock could take a drink. When he took a drink, the hair rolled straight up on his head. I said, Jesus Christ, I said. And then he took another drink, and his eyes turned red and stuck out. I said, my goodness. And he took another one in his ears. I said, you know, I said, uh, Christ, I said, this is the way I look when I got home. I said, no wonder uh, things were happening to me. So between Bullock and my sponsor, <clears throat> I stayed sober until I was able to read and understand the 12 steps. <laughs> So what I'm talking about, the message is there if you want to receive it. And what I would do, you know, is whenever this unpredictable age, the, the, the drink would occur, I would take a dollar and a half and go over there and get a bottle and wait the bullet get off from work and take him up in the alley there and watch him go through that routine. <laughs> and that, and that, and that. So, so... So, after about six or seven months of going through, that was the, the, the beginning of my sobriety, I started to get sober. Sobriety began to mean something to me. But then that came a sort of a boy. I was on cloud nine, I felt good. And there was, but there was something empty in that. And there was something missing. And I, Somehow, I didn't want to go back to the way I was. Staying sober, I felt different from what I had ever felt before. And that was when I was really introduced to real service. I can remember our group. We used to go over to Baltimore. We used to go all over Maryland and nearby. And even in Virginia, and we would take me. And that was the experience for me that I like to think about. Because from that, I get what you say up there. Gratitude is the language of the heart. Gratitude is the language of the heart. To be able to give what you receive without expecting any compensation is important to me. And that's why I am here today. And that's why I am interested in service. It's not so much I think what it does for me, but it's always good for me to see people come in the program, see people get sober, and to see groups grow, to see AA develop, and to be a part of what's happening in AA. I've seen a lot of things happen in AA. I've seen a lot of changes for the better happen in AA. And I'm one of these firm believers that things will continue to change and happen for the better for AA. And it might not be due to people. It might not be due to recovering alcoholics so much as it is to the steps the tradition and the concept that are guidelines for us to follow. Because, you know, I still suffer from the same thing that I suffered from in the beginning. That is, that self-will and that self-knowledge, it creeps in. You know, I like to sponsor people, too, because that son of a gun, he'll do what I tell him to do, you know. I say, hop, he hop. And, uh, you know, that was an experience. I mean, I used to like this bomb. So finally I run across the Joker, and he 
to sponsor, and he did every damn thing I told him not to do. And I was marking on my calendar when he was going to get drunk. And it hurt my ego. It hurt my ego to go to his anniversary. He's been sober for 16 years. I have other problems with my self-will, too, you know. And, and we, we give lip service to what these traditions and everything talk about in that second tradition. Uh, I, I'm a member of a Mideast group in uh, Washington now. And you can say what you want to. I don't ask them to ask me something, but I'm damn sorry expecting them to do it. <laughs> I mean, in other ways, uh, 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 as much as uh, we want to give up sometimes, we will not and cannot give up some of the defects that we talk about. So I am Garrett Taylor. I am your alcoholic trustee. And I am here today and I'm surviving because I'm still living with those defects that I promised that I wouldn't give up in step six and seven. I still got them defects, and I'm holding on to them. I'm willing to give them up, but somehow they stay in there. But I think the important thing for me and my sobriety, too, is that I have managed to a degree is to clean up that debris of the past. And to me, that is what this program of action is about. And that is steps three through nine. In my life today, I don't say basically is living the 12 steps. But my life today is living step 10 and 11 and 12. Step 10, I continue to take personal inventory of myself. And when I'm wrong, I promptly admit it. That is important to me. Not to go back from three to nine, but step ten. That is a part of my everyday living. Step eleven is to seek through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God. Praying only for my knowledge of His will for me and His power to carry that out. On those two steps hinges my sobriety. And on those two steps hinges my attitude of gratitude. And on those two steps, I hope I will be able to say AA as a whole as you have delegated me to do it. I want to thank you, and I'm glad you invited me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.